or later, all the crew members start to die. The electrician gets electrocuted. One of the guys painting the scenery paints himself to death. You know, it's like Ten Little Indians. It's like an Agatha Christie movie. Well, obviously, it's Leslie. The actor playing Leslie is a method actor, and he wears the mask all the time. We never know who he is. So there's a guy playing me in the movie. There's a guy playing my character, Doc O'Halloran. There's a guy playing the girl. There's a guy playing her assistants. And then there, so we all sit around together in the motel, in the woods, talking. So we have our own doppelgangers. And one by one, the crew starts getting killed. And it's brilliant, you guys. But I think what happened is, Scotty Glosserman, our director, producer, creator, writer, I think Scotty knocked on doors so long, he got so close to raising all the money. But sometimes that last half a million is the most important. Because if you don't get that, you're not really making the movie you're supposed to make. And I think he just had a little bit of financing fatigue. And I think we're going to get this movie made because it's a great, great sequel script. You guys, I'm telling you, I mean, you guys know how good the original script was. This script is even better. And, it, and, and, and instead of it turning into the hardcore sexy girl victim slasher movie, organically, we turn into Agatha Christie, Ten Little Indians on a movie set. But everybody dies according to their job. You know, which I just think is a great gimmick. Okay, new question. In the back, one more in the back. I see somebody here. Yes. No. This young lady. <laughs> You're next. I promise you. Shout. Shout, shout. Guys, I never know. You know, this is the weird thing. Uh, TV's so weird. Like, like, yesterday, I got a call to do a cooking show in New York. You never know when, when, when stuff's going to come up. And I have to go back. Uh, one of the things I'm going to be doing when I go back, and it's, it's not acting, but i got to tell you, I've seen the storyboards, and they're great. I am going to be your new host on the Chiller Channel. I'm hoping after the first series of things I do for them, I'm hoping that maybe I can, like, like maybe infect them with some choices for some films. You know, movies like May and movies like Brian De Palmer's Sisters. I want to do like Robert England, 11 o'clock, Friday night double bills, you know? Yeah. So, because, I mean, I love stuff. I love old and new, you guys. I love old and new. And I like to blend that. And that's why I love coming here. And you guys, I just want to say, you know, there's an actor that, that Dave invited here. And, uh, and, and, and he's huge right now. And you guys love him from Walking Dead, Scott Wilson. But you guys, Scott Wilson, I, I wanted to be Scott Wilson in the 70s. And Scott, there's movies that Scott's done that are a little forgotten. You don't, no one forgets In Cold Blood. And no one forgets, you know, his great Gatsby. He was brilliant. But I know these dark little movies that Scott did, like Lolly Madonna War. Woo! And The Grissom Gang. And, and Scott's such an incredible actor. And I, I had a night, and Scott doesn't remember this. We were drinking tequila and smoking a little bit. <clears throat> and we were, we were in Topanga Canyon, and we were looking out over Santa Monica Bay, and Scott was sitting in an old oak mission rocker. And I was just, God, I was so grateful even to be on the deck with Scott Wilson. And I remember Scott started to do Hamlet. He did. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I from Hamlet. And then I was talking to him later, after another shot of tequila, and Scott was telling me about The Great Gatsby, and he was saying, you know, Robert, he goes, they, they hurt part of my performance because I would do a scene, and they would put a hundred violins underneath it. It was like the London Philharmonic. And he gave me this advice about you always have to be careful because you never know what kind of music they're gonna put under your performance. Mm -hmm. So this is me in 1974. 75 sitting next to Scott Wilson and he told me this he's like the best they never teach you that in acting class they never teach you that in drama 101 or some acting workshop you know in Cherry Hill or in Philly or in New York they never tell you that 
It's the best advice anybody's ever given me about how you have to fight against that, you know, that sentimentality. And, and, and you know, Scott's just so amazing, and I'm just so glad, you know, for the huge, huge success of Walking Dead. And I try to tell Chad or Emily or Scott about this experience Nancy and I had. You know, every guy in the genre business, sooner or later you have to do your giant snake movie, your killer bee movie, <laughs> or your giant alligator movie. Well, I've goddamn done all three. <laughs> So I'm in a car with a beautiful blonde Hitchcock Elizabeth Rome from Law and Order. And the beautiful which 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 help me, which which blade? Nancy Barber. Yes. Nancy Barber. You know what I'm talking about, how hot is she? And we're yeah, driving in the back of an old car with a communist uh, a taxi driver into into Sofia, Bulgaria. We need pizza, we need a hot bath. We've been wrestling alligators for about six weeks. We're cold, the season has changed. And as we come into Sofia, Bulgaria, with the gypsy, and I don't mean this with any kind of judgment or stereotype, but there's literally gypsy camps on either side of their only freeway. And now we're getting downtown and everything's getting better and the Soviets are gone and it's starting to get better and there's a great, pedestrian walkover, the, the freeway. The entire pedestrian walkover is more high tech than anything in the US. It's totally digital. This is three years ago. Totally digital. It's, an, it's Blade Runner. And it's scenes from The Walking Dead. So that's what a hit The Walking Dead is. That's what I mean about international. Horror, science fiction, fantasy, translating to international audiences. Three and a half years ago, in Bulgaria, there was a pedestrian crossover, better than any sign on 42nd Street in Manhattan, with scenes from The Walking Dead. It was already the number one show there. People living in a trailer the size of my shoe were watching it with stolen electricity in a gypsy <laughs> camp by the side of the road. So, Walking Dead is a player. Yes! Yes! Zombies! Yeah. Yes, sir. We all love the franchise, the L2 franchise. Would there have been any benefit to the original L2 being a standalone film? Well, mm -hmm. you know, we never imagined, no one ever imagined that it would have become this international franchise. We knew we'd done something interesting. You know, Sean Cunningham did second unit on the original Nightmare. And you guys have to understand how beautiful, how unbelievably beautiful Heather and Johnny were back then. And so I knew, because I'd been around the block, I knew that they were extraordinarily gorgeous, dewy, moist, lovely, phenomenally. I mean, I, you guys like, I mean, Justin Bieber comes up to my knee. Johnny Depp's <laughs> taller than me. I mean, these were real movie stars. You know, Heather looked like what you wanted Brooke Shields to look like. Brooke Shields is gorgeous. I know Brooke, but Brooke is tall. And for all of us guys, that's a little intimidating. Brooke's model height, Heather, Heather's a spinner. You guys know what I'm talking about. Hey, hey! All right. Come on. Oh, I gotta laugh on it. You guys know what I'm saying. We all like that, you know. You, you know, and you know, you can, Heather can wear high heels, and I can still dance with her. And and so beautiful, and so smart, and so talented, both of them. They couldn't make a mistake. So we knew we were onto something. Plus, Wes, brilliant. We loved Wes back then. Wes, you gotta understand, Wes was like David Lynch. The Hills Have Eyes, Last House on the Left. They were violent and dark, but they weren't quite Toby Hooper Chainsaw. They were more David Lynch, uh, uh, leather, uh, not, what is it called, um, Eraserhead. So we, we you know, that was, that was West back then. Ronnie had just been nominated for an Oscar for Nashville. We knew we were on something, John Saxon. Here's a little mm. parenthetical. Just so you know, like this is like weird bonuses to your career. Not money, not residuals, not surprise money, or cartoon voices. I get to hang out with John Saxon. Dave's invited me here, and John here. 
And Dave said goodnight to me in the bar downstairs here at 9 o'clock at night. And I've gone out down the street here for Italian food with John Saxon and his beautiful lady and my wife. And John Saxon will open up to me. John Saxon starred with Robert Redford, not once, but twice. Electric Horseman and the, and the War Hunter. John Saxon starred with Marlon Brando in the Appaloosa. John Saxon starred with Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon. John Saxon starred for Quentin Tarantino on C CSI, on a two-hour special event CSI. John Saxon made love on camera to Audrey Hepburn in The Unforgiven and made Burt Lancaster jealous, directed by John Huston. John Saxon made love to Natalie Wood and Sandra Dee on film. John Saxon made love to Francis Ford Coppola's first lover, Luana Anders, in low-budget films in the, in the 50s. John Saxon has touched everything. And, I mean, he is a connection. John Saxon and Henry Fonda are my connections to that Hollywood, to older Hollywood, to Betty Davis Hollywood. And then I get, and I can tell you guys that. And then you guys can tell people that. But that's the through line and the connection. And John Saxon knows stories about Vincent Price. These, you know, it's this connection that you get. My makeup man worked on Betty Davis's last movie with, did Betty Davis's makeup and spent eight weeks with Vincent Price on a beach in Maine and talked about me and told Vincent about me and asked Vincent all these questions. So I got my connection to Vincent, finally. And Vincent Price went out doing Wales of August with Betty Davis and the biggest star of Silent Screen, Lillian Gish, with my makeup man and talking about me at lunch. And I got that connection, I got that cooked to that, you know, so I finally, because I didn't know Karloff, I know, I know Karloff's daughter, and I did a documentary on Karloff with his daughter, but that's how we get the through line, and years from now, there's going to be great new stuff on cable, and on network, and, 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 the, and those will be people that, and I'll be like the old man, playing the old professor or something, and I'll tell them, and then they can tell stuff to your kids, you know, but that's how we get the truth and the legends of all this cool stuff that we all love, you guys, in my living room, and I try to keep my showbiz out of the living room, but I couldn't keep my 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea original poster from Brussels, 1954, in the language of Jules Verne. I can't keep my Robbie the Robot original Ooh. robot. You don't know what Forbidden Planet did to this cowboy when Ooh. I was a little baby and I saw that show at a matinee. Oh my God, you guys. So I'm like you guys. I'm just a little more innocent because it wasn't quite as, as violent or nasty, although Horrors of the Black Museum was pretty hardcore. I remember the, the nails coming out of the binoculars when that, when those were like, Ooh. Ooh. and some of the hammer, some of the hammer was truly erotic. I mean, I remember I remember I, I had a girl's bra half unfastened at the drive-in movie, and I looked up at the screen, and Barbara Steele was bleeding out of the corner of her mouth into her cleavage, and I, I kind of preferred that. <laughs> What's wrong with Robert England? <laughs> no, but the guy, no, you know what I mean, you guys. We all know what I mean. Anyway, another question. Way in the back, the guy with a hat. Yeah! Shout it out, you slacker MF. <laughs> No, you know, that was Wes. Wes wanted to send us all up and make us really a little different than who we really were because he wanted to make this point about Hollywood exploiting horror and you guys and loving you guys and borrowing from you guys and we know that you know what we're doing but we can still scare you. And, and he wanted to make a point about all of that. He, Wes was very successful then and so that's not really me. That's an asshole version of me. Um, I don't paint. I don't live in a huge Spanish Hollywood mansion. I live in a little funny 
bungalow in a very nice beach town, don't get me wrong, uh, and I'm, but I'm three blocks from the beach with my dogs and my beautiful wife, but, you know, and I've lived there for a long time because of Freddie, but I did, I did collect photography for a while, so that's what Wes made the artist connection with, and Heather is married to a famous makeup man, but he never worked on any of Wes's movies, so that was a big, you know, extension there. But Heather did have some bizarre fan problems. So that was an early, you know, paparazzi fan stalker thing that he was pursuing there. Um, and then the idea of what if we took a legend or a myth or a truth from the Incas or the Aztecs or the Egyptians or the Babylonians. What if we took something like that? You've all seen The Exorcist, the Zuzu, the very first image you see graven. What if one of those things we borrowed from, just one of, one of them really was real and really was evil incarnate and we pissed it off. <laughs> so that's what we were doing with the new nightmare. That's really the, the kind of fun we were having. Uh, questions? I see somebody right here. My, you guys, you heard me talk about the remakes. He wants to know about my opinion on the new nightmare. It's, it's that it was too soon. I love Clancy Brown, okay? I love Jackie Earl Haley. I love, um, who's, the, who's the great little actress from Social Network? Help me. She's got a sister. I love, I love Rooney Mara. You know, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. I have kids that I've worked with in that movie. The boy from uh, Jennifer's Body. Uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I love it. We played my son in a movie with Brian Cox called Red. I, I love that cast. I think they tried too hard, and I think they, their reshoots that they packed up in the front, as good as that opening is, what it did was it made everybody in the movie already damaged by Freddy. You have to know, that you have to meet these people before the damage has been done so you can invest in them emotionally, then you see the damage that the myth, the legend, the story of Freddy does to them, or the haunting of Freddy does to them. They can't be haunted from the get-go, or you don't have anywhere to go with them, they just become damaged goods. So, and then I also, I think that movie just came out too soon. I think that movie came out two summers from now, or next summer, I, I think it would be a lot better received. I just think it was too soon. Now, another, criticism I have, and it's taken me a long time to come up with this. And I worship the ground Jackie Earl Haley walks on, and I am happy and proud and honored to hand the baton to him. Jackie Earl Haley was in a movie I loved years ago called Breaking Away, about the bicycle racers. Jackie Earl Haley's the best thing in Watchmen. Jackie Earl Haley is brilliant in a cameo in Shutter Island. Yeah. Um, Fuck that RoboCop, but anyway, <laughs> but listen, Jackie, Jackie's, Jackie's a terrific actor, but the makeup on Jackie is photorealism. It's photorealism. And Freddy does not occupy reality. Freddy occupies the imagination of his potential victims. So in your imagination, we all exaggerate. We all use different fears and surrealism and imagination and our own personal things to define what Freddie might or might not look at. So whenever I, so the makeup that, that Jackie was wearing is just a little too real for me. It's a little too photorealistic for me. Um, but that's only a criticism I have after seeing the movie a couple times and with some hindsight on it. It's a brilliant makeup. But Freddy's not documentary. Freddy's not documentary. Freddy's exaggerated. Freddy's a myth. And, and, and I think you have, to, you have to play it that way. Freddy's not walking down the street, you know, doing nasty things to your kids. Freddy's a what if. And he's in your head. And he's in your subconscious. And he knows what's in your diary and he knows what's in your underwear drawer. <laughs> and that's the most private places you have. So watch out for Freddy. 
Yes. Front row. How did you find out? How did you find the character for Freddy Krueger? How did I find the character? You, know you guys have heard this story before. How did I find? No, I was like, you know, I had some ideas, and the makeup helped probably seventy percent. And I'm sitting in summer, Summer Olympics, L.A., and I'm sitting in the uh, Lucy Desi, uh, Desi Lou makeup room in these old barber chairs. They're kind of pink, faded pink. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I've shot about two or three days, and I'm, I'm saying, I don't know if this is the right thing. I don't know. Maybe I should have. Like, I've been up at four in the morning, and they're basting me with KY jelly, and they're poking at me. Dave Miller just come off a thriller. He's poking me with a really dry, crusty brush in my nose and my butt and my ears. <laughs> and uh, he, he doesn't have a great bedside manner, even though he's a genius. And I look over, and here's Heather Langenkamp, the most beautiful girl in the world in this moment of time. And next to her is Johnny Depp, the handsomest man in the world at this time. They don't need makeup. They have no need for any glamour corrective makeup. They're both getting makeup. They're getting their <laughs> eyelashes stretched. They're get, and, and then they give them, Johnny and Heather, right next to me, they give them little fans, little portable fans to keep them cool in the summer in L.A. at the old Desilu Studios. And I'm sitting there, and I'm getting basted with KY jelly and Vaseline, you know, and I'm itchy, and I'm wondering, did I do the right thing? And I look over, and I envy them. I envy them both. Their beauty, their youth, their entire careers in front of them. And I went, oh, Robert. You can use that. That's Ooh. something. That's an acting trick. Your envy of Johnny and Heather can be your hatred of all these kids. Because Freddie hates youth and beauty. Freddie wants to stop it. Because Freddie never had that and never will. And that was the little accidental. I didn't prepare. I didn't do research. I didn't do my method exercises. That was the click for me. But I could turn that on right now. I can turn it on immediately. Because that moment is in me. That moment that I looked over at them. It's in me and I can just go there. So if I've got to throw Heather down on the ground for a second, or Johnny, you know, or any actor in one of those sequences, I can go to that. And it can just be, I wish I was young and beautiful. You son of a bitch. And boom, <laughs> it's right there. How many more questions, Dave? Want to do two more. Yeah, two more. The second to the last. The penultimate question. The guy with the hat way over here. Oh, no, it's Steven Spielberg. Stand up, sir. <laughs> this guy's drunker than I am, you guys. He was with me in a bar tonight. Shout. Thank you. 